You're listening to Health Innovators, a podcast and video show about the leaders, influencers, and early adopters who are shaping the future of healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy Mooney. Welcome back to the show, Health Innovators. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with Luca Yankopoulos, who is the CEO and founder of Grapevine. Welcome to the show, Luca. Hey there, Dr. Roxy. I've been a longtime listener on the other side of the podcast, so I'm honored and excited to be on this side of the microphone today. That's awesome. I am so glad to have you here. So let's just start off by um, kind of sharing with our listeners, why do you do what you do? Yeah, I mean, I got involved in, I guess, healthcare supply chain out of uh, a feeling and need to sort of protect and, and help um, people that I love and that I care for. I was a college student when the pandemic struck and stuck in my dorm room with a couple of roommates um, and without any classes sort of ongoing, we looked at the world. We were talking, I was talking to my mom, my dad, my dad's a scientific researcher, um, a founder of a pharmaceutical company called Regeneron. And my mom's a nurse practitioner at the time she was working at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And, you know, these supply chain shortages were having a real impact on frontline workers. Um, not only that, but they were also having a huge financial impact on medical practices um, and, you know, healthcare entities. So our call to action, you know, for me and my, my co-founders was really a need or a want to protect the people that were heroically working on the front line during the pandemic mm -hmm. um, and keep them sort of stocked. We believe that, yeah, I guess that's 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 how we got involved. That was our our reason for getting involved is trying to protect the people uh, that we care about. So, how did that evolve into um, Grapevine and what it is today? Yeah, the, I mean, healthcare supplies, and by healthcare supplies, I mean you know medical devices and PPE and even like surgical implants. There's a lot of lack of of transparency. And by that, I mean, doctors, you know, business owners, they're not confident that they're getting the best deal on their supplies and they're not able to keep their supplies in stock when they need it. So at Grapevine, our mission is to give confidence to those uh, who own medical practices or work in medical practices confidence that they're getting the best deal on the supplies that they need while keeping all the supplies they need in stock without anyone from the practice even lifting a finger. Um, Grapevine finds savings while you sleep and it keeps you stocked through chaos. And that's really sort of our mission here. And, and we're doing things pretty differently. You know, we're not a, a old fashioned healthcare distributor, a McKesson, a Henry Schein, a Medline. Um, we do it through technology, artificial intelligence, and, and data management. That was my next question. What you're describing sounds like a GPO, and how is what you're doing different? Yeah, it is it is functionally, like I think, a, a similar spot in the market as a GPO. We definitely are helping you connect with a broad network of vendors um, and ensuring that every time you add to cart, it's from the best possible vendor optimized for your needs, whether that's get it to me quickly, or it's let's save the most money possible on this. The, the difference between us and a GPO is how the practice administrator or the person who actually handles purchasing an order of supplies would interact with mm -hmm. Grapevine versus a GPO. With the GPO, it's a lot of personal relationships, communication, emails back and forth, and so on. Uh, with Grapevine, it's very simple. You log in one time, you link your McKesson, Shine, Medline account, whoever else you might work with as far as specialty medical suppliers, um, just by typing in your username and credentials. We then have a uh, connection to those, a digital connection, right, to each of those suppliers. And we read in all of your order history in a second, right? By the time you've clicked sort of submit and save, in a second, we've read in all of that order history to see what you buy, who you buy it from. And people form habits, right? If you've ever worked mm -hmm. with the practice admin or you yourself as a listener are a practice admin, right? Um, you buy your band-aids from one place, you buy your mask from another place, you buy your sutures and scalpel blades from another place and you do it because that's what you've always done. Uh, but what you don't know is that 70% of the products sold by, for example, McKesson aren't actually you know, manufactured by McKesson and they're not McKesson branded. 
um, Henry Schein, Medline, they sell those same products and there's no one supplier. There's no one sort of entity that is the best at everything, right? Um, each supplier's got their own, you know, own strengths and weaknesses. And it's important to be constantly evaluating, looking to see if there's a better opportunity to switch and save and how that sort of looks and feels for uh, the practice admin is once they've linked those accounts, you know, we give them just a, a recommended list of products. You should switch from A to B, McKesson is shine on the band-aids and you'll save 60%. You should switch to all these items. They approve it and they set it and forget it. Um, they never need a login again. Their orders are constantly delivered to their place um, and it's coming from the trusted vendors that they know. So how is this similar or different to um, kind of like a B2, an Amazon for B2B in healthcare? Totally. I mean, um, that's, what, that's what comes to mind when I hear you describe it. Yeah, yeah. And, and in a way it is, right? It is, it is quite similar, right? We don't, there's, there's similarities in that we're connecting you with a broad network of vendors. Um, yeah. We do introduce you constantly to new vendors saying, hey, right now, today you work with these three big suppliers, but there's this small importer of supplies. They're the ones actually supplying McKesson, Shine, and Medline. You can connect with them online today and start purchasing that product at one tenth of the price that you you were previously paying for it. So there is that marketplace sort of broad vendor network component to it. A difference is if you shop on Amazon, you have certainly come across a situation where you didn't find what you're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. Amazon mm -hmm. is loading in a list of vendors and you know whatever it is, a, almost a, maybe a billion products, right? Um, that they've found and they've curated vendors who've signed up and are willing to pay. Um, to sort of display and market their products on Amazon and consumers. With Grapevine, it's not limited to the vendors that we bring in, it's as many vendors as you wanna bring in. So it's not just a world of supplies that you know, Grapevine or Amazon has curated for you. It's a, it's a add to that supply at any point. So if you go on Amazon and you realize, hey, it's missing this, whatever, I, you know, they don't have a lot of luxury goods or a refrigerator that you wanted to buy or a home appliance, right? Maybe Amazon doesn't have these things. Um, you can't buy it on Amazon. On Grapevine, you simply link the other website that you would be able to buy it. And then you can not only, you know, purchase that product on, on Grapevine continuously, but you'll also be presented similar cheaper priced alternatives. Sounds good. Sounds like the uh, solving some of the inefficiencies that we have in healthcare, um, and who doesn't want an Amazon-like experience <laughs> in, totally. in, in in any aspect of our lives? So you, you're, um, you know, Grapevine is an early stage company. So let's kind of talk about some of the growth strategies that you've deployed so far, and um, you know, that have been successful to kind of get you where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, initially we were investing in, you know, email marketing and trying to hire salespeople uh, to bring on new customers that had a long Rolodex of, of healthcare, you know, healthcare businesses. Um, and that was really a temporary thing. We launched last January, so about a year ago, and we were doing that for maybe three, six months. Um, and we were able to get new customers in that fashion, um, sort of get feedback and figure out what other problems they were facing. And initially we were more of like an Amazon style, easy to buy marketplace from a bunch of vendors. Um, we learned the sort of limitations of what Amazon could really do for a healthcare business, right? One mm -hmm. being sort of checks and balances or financial budgets, right? Maybe a nurse wants to request certain items for a specific location, but the financial manager wants to review each purchase before it gets sent out to the supplier, right? So we iterated and built based on uh, the initial sort of needs of our of our early users. Um, and from that point, we were able to build something so powerful and so helpful for healthcare practices, um, business owners and practice administrators that uh, we've turned off all of our, our growth and marketing channels. Uh, from this point, you know, actually from about two, three months ago, we're, you know, having about 10 new healthcare businesses join Grapevine each day. And all of those companies are coming from referrals. So at this stage, sort of like the marketing aspect isn't something that we're investing in. We've actually turned it all off. We've got, you know, more people signing up than we can really handle. And it's all coming from sort of word of mouth. 
uh, the biggest challenge for growth and scaling for us is is really building the support to sufficiently you know handle all the new people trying to sign up and get them sort of up to speed um you know on, on in a timely manner yeah, it's interesting because even in 2023, the number one marketing um, strategy is word of mouth marketing. And the way that you can accomplish that in an early stage company as yourself is if you're solving a problem that a specific avatar or, I, um, you know, a, a persona is is actively looking to solve right so if there's high demand for what you have and you do a really good job with it they're going to tell other people yeah absolutely and and the simple problem right that different people at the healthcare practice face i mean for business owners it's that you're spending way too much on supplies like two to three times what you should be spending on supplies especially if you're buying from only you know a mckesson or only a henry shine you need to diversify you need to create competition within your suppliers and you know, the, the big problem for the practice administrators, you know, or the person who actually handles purchasing is that, you know, it's often a nurse or a doctor and that person should be prioritizing patient care, but instead they're bogged down with lidocaine shortages and back orders and finding new suppliers and yeah. comparing prices. And they should be focused on delivering the best quality of patient care, not on optimizing supply chains. And that's where we come in where that free new employee that's going to really act like an army of a thousand employees and ensure you're always getting the best price and you're not lifting a finger to do it. That's great. So what are some of the challenges that you've experienced along the way? We know that the entrepreneurial journey is not just rainbows and butterflies. <laughs> um, uh, any challenges that you've experienced that you guys have had to overcome? Yeah, the biggest challenge um, is that this industry is lagging, you know, very far behind a lot of other industries. And there are some power players, you know, the distribution dinosaurs is what we call them, the multi hundred yeah. year old, hundreds of billions of dollars of sales companies that, you know, that dominate medical supplies. We've talked about them already, McKesson, you know, Henry Schein. And a lot of times healthcare practices are pressured by their primary supplier and McKesson of sorts to one lock in a contract to get better prices, meaning like an exclusivity contract. You can't look anywhere else, creating a mini monopoly in the market where it says, well, yeah, I can get this product for half the price from Henry Schein McKesson. Why am I locked into a contract? Right? So this sort of like pressure to monopolize the spend of individual healthcare practices or medical practices, you know, to destroy competition and prevent sort of transparency of supply options and, and, you know, freedom of, of choice when it comes to getting better prices. That's like really the biggest problem. We get pushback from some of those big suppliers. They don't want, you know, those medical practices using a product like Grapevine, because with Bra Grapevine, they see that McKesson isn't offering the best price on the same product. They can get it from somewhere else cheaper, and they should. And when that happens, you know, McKesson loses revenue. So it's a problem that we're seeing. And when there's these power players like McKesson that have hundreds of billions of dollars to spend, and they've got decade-long relationships with people at these medical practices, they are able to sort of weasel their, their way into, you know, contracts and put pressure on them to avoid a solution like grapevine keeping people sort of in the stone ages when it comes to their their healthcare supply chain so um you know the, what comes to mind is like the kodaks and blockbusters of the world right <laughs> the incumbents that are resistant to change um and new entrants like yourself that come in and disrupt things um and, and end up stealing market share uh yeah and with new business models and our goal is like we don't think that we will replace like we think that there is a, an important place in this world for Medline, for Henry Schein, and even for McKesson, right? It's just that we think people need a, a tool to evaluate those options openly and make the best choice. And I do think that that's going to redirect a lot of the market share from McKesson to Medline. 
people, if, if you're listening and you buy, for example, like a Beck and Dickinson needle, that's manufactured by a company called Beck and Dickinson, um, the Safety Intima or the Insight Auto Guard or the, whatever it is. If you're buying that on McKesson, no matter how big you are, you're probably paying, you know, somewhere like $100 a box. I beg you, don't, if you don't sign up for Grapevine, the one thing you should do is please sign up for Medline and look what Medline is going to charge you for that same exact item number. They're selling the same product from Beck and Dickinson and it's 50% off and you don't know it. All you got to do is sign up and be able to sort of manage spend across two vendors. And we can help with sort of making quick choices and not having to open up two windows and dance between portals, but it's really important, right? To diversify your options. If you buy toilet, you know, let's, I, li I like to think about the actual like consumer shopping, um, like you or me, Dr. Roxy on the weekend, maybe we have to go and, and run some errands for our household. Right. So I might run to CVS to pick up some medication cause I'm feeling a little bit sick. And then I go to, you know, target to get a new blanket and garbage bags. And then I go to whole foods. I'm checking out three different times at three different stores. And by the time I get to whole foods, the last stop on my, you know, on my little GPS, um, I've already bought my shit from CVS and from, you know, Target. So if I see something at Whole Foods, the garbage bags or even the day quill, and it's half the price, what am I going to go back, drive 15 minutes just to return? No, it's crazy. <laughs> it's madness. But they've got the same products across different vendors. And if you can effortlessly sort of see all those options in one place, and when you add one product off that shelf in Whole Foods to your cart, and you got a big pop-up literally, you know, in your face that says, wait. Don't buy it here at Whole Foods. It's at CVS and you're going there anyway and it's half the price, right? That's what we're doing at Grapevine. And then we break down the walls between those stores so you have one checkout experience, right? You don't need to check out a bunch of times. Um, and it's it's something helpful that I wish I had in my own sort of consumer shopping life when I do my errands on the weekends. But it's also something that, you know, these businesses need when they're spending hundreds of thousands or tens of millions of dollars on, on medical supplies. It's just being flushed down the toilet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. So um, as you think about, um, you know, your journey, you're about a year in, how have you grown as an entrepreneur over this time? And what are some of the advantages that you have as maybe a younger innovator um, and someone who has family and people in your network in healthcare, but not entrenched into the healthcare system? Like, what are some of those advantages that you have um, to be able to come in and disrupt a, a dinosaur industry? Yeah, I like I like reading books, um, and I. I read a lot of these sort of like nonfiction startup entrepreneurship books. And mm -hmm. um, one I just recently finished reading was one called the Bezos Blueprint. And it was about the sort of founding principles of Amazon. They yeah. talk about, you know, Jeff Bezos, apparently every day you'd come in and talk about day one mentality. My dad taught me the same principle. Um, he called it beginner's mind mentality, which is like the Buddhist principle. Idea being that you should approach every day and every situation as if it's your first day looking at those problems. Don't fall into a routine, right? Accepting the system as it is and playing within the rules that your forefathers and foremothers have set. Instead, you know, look at it as if no one's ever touched it and that you're the first person that has the opportunity mm -hmm. to fix it. Um, and we really try to practice that here. I think that being a young entrepreneur in this space you know, allows me, I'm not polluted with years of experience right. that tells me this is the way it needs to work with supply. You need yeah. to enter into a contract with your supplier to get the best price. Like that's right. crazy. Imagine you can only buy <laughs> toilet paper from CVS for the rest of your right. life. That would be insane. You'd never, and then they would just raise their prices on you and they'd know you couldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I think like the most valuable thing that we, we bring to the table as sort of young entrepreneurs in the space is that beginner's mind or that day one mentality. And it helps us bring fresh perspective and, and new solutions uh, to the space. And it's something I hope we never lose. It's something I want to bring to my personal life and my, you know, the, the workplace and the industry I'm in till the day I die. And it's, it's always hard to, to not fall into a routine, to not fall into the things you know how to do well. Um, but to keep sure. pushing the frontier forward. 
prioritizing your customers and making them number one and their voice more important than your voice is, I think, really critical to being able to achieve that. It helps, I think, when we elevate the value of that, it helps us overcome some of our biases that might get in the way over time. I, I couldn't agree more. And even with right this podcast, right, like we're here talking to the listeners. If there are not listeners, like what are we doing in this conversation other than having a maybe a nice introductory meeting, you know, and maybe there's, I, I don't know, but it's, it's important to have relevance to, to your audience, to your, to your customer and to be always focused on, on making value for them. And we talked about funding before we started the, the pod here, Dr. Oxy, and that's yeah. like a beautiful thing that funding has allowed us to do. We don't need to be a profit driven organization at this stage. We're not focusing on pinching pennies and making an extra percent off our customers. Our platform is completely free to use right now for healthcare businesses. It's going to change at some point. At some point, we're going to need to make money. But right now, it's about learning the customer's needs and delivering a maximum amount of value because that's what makes us valuable. That's what makes us get paid. That's what makes us a profitable com company in the future. And right now, we're fortunate enough to have raised you know, a few million dollars just today um, which, which allows us to keep focusing on the customer. We don't need to focus on how to keep the business running. We just need to focus on delivering value to the business owners of medical practices and to the actual practice admin or the person placing orders for supplies and managing the inventory. Um, so and that's let's all talk about do. that a little bit, because when you think about our audience, a lot of them are in the same similar stage of raising capital. And, you know, we've read so much over the last couple of years about how difficult um, the fundraising market is. And you've had some success. So what is that fundraising journey been like for you that's maybe positioned your company differently in order to get access to the capital that maybe other organizations are really struggling to get? Yeah. Um, I think there's a bit of luck in all, in all success, um, but it's also persistence. And we were, so three years ago or whatever, whenever the, the pandemic hit, I guess four years ago now, the, the pandemic hits, and like I said, it's me, my roommates in our college dorm, and we are thinking about how we can help, you know, my mom and roommate's cousin and, and so on. And we're seeing these shortages of supplies, and we had just had a class on uh, data management of customs and border protection, or, you know, US CBP um, sort of data. So actually, every product that comes into the United States is actually um, you know sort of scanned and recorded and publicly published to everyone in America. You could see it, and we sort of started looking at that data and found some verified inflows of medical supplies that I was hearing were in shortage: the masks, the gowns, the gloves, right? And I just handed a contact off, like we scraped that information, that data from the U.S. government, and handed it off to the people at you know, the medical practices and medical institutions that we knew were struggling. They were struggling because they had historically only worked with one major supplier. Yeah. It was like three weeks later, we didn't have any business in mind. And again, I think it goes back to your idea, Dr. Oxy, of delivering value to the customer, right? If that's mm -hmm. your intent, everything else falls into place. And if you focus on that and you are resilient and you, and you don't give up on that, the other things will fall into place. Three weeks later, we get a phone call from McKesson with an order, a purchase order, I didn't know what a purchase order was, a purchase order for like a million three ply masks. And I was like, dude, I'm like a college kid in my dorm. What oh are my you gosh, doing? Luke. He's saying, we'll send you, we'll send you whatever half a million dollars. And I'm like, all right. So I go on legal zoom, make an LLC, you know, <laughs> set up a bank oh account, God. scrambling. Um, so that, I, I that anecdote, that was the luck part, right? Yeah. Yeah. We got lucky and we got some money early, not from fundraising, but because we had the intention of delivering value, not to even customers at that point, just to people that we cared about. Right. And our intentions were true. We just wanted to help them get through these stock shortages. Um, yeah. From there, obviously, we see an opportunity. Um, and when there's an opportunity, you know, I put I get tunnel vision. I go fully into that path. 
And I said, okay, we've got a little bit of jangle in our pocket. This can take us a long way because something is severely broken in this industry if they're giving college kids a huge <laughs> amount of money <laughs> who have no experience in doing anything. So from there, yeah, I mean, I mean, we we put a lot of effort, me and my college roommates, years of ups and downs, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And and continued to build our sort of financial network. And we got lucky again when the University of Pennsylvania awarded us the President's Innovation Prize and a quarter million dollars of non-equity funding. Um, mm -hmm. So that alongside the money we had made through the sort of like distribution model of uh, sort of distributing mass to the pandemic allowed us to really kickstart our business. So we were self-funded, but it all came back to trying to deliver value to the customer and staying on track. And it's, it's really hard to balance like staying on track and being persistent with also that beginner's mind thing, because you got to know when to pivot and you should be pivoting yeah. every day, right? Because of the beginner's mind attitude, but you also need to be resiliently working hard with the, the same aim of delivering value to a specific group of people. Um, and I, I think, think that's, that's the art and science of entrepreneurship is knowing when to stay the course and kind of defy or dismiss um, the naysayers or the people that are speaking into you saying, this is not going to work. You need to go in a different direction. You need to sell to this market. You need to focus on this, um, you know, ICP and so forth um, versus when that advice or that guidance that's coming in is actually like true. And you do need to like for a number of reasons and being able to juggle that and manage that. And it's not like you do that one time, right? So it's not like you've only had to make that decision one time in the last 12 months. <laughs> you know, it's a constant juggle of, do I listen to this? Do I listen to this? Do I listen to my gut instinct? Is it the customer? Um, you know, I think that is the art and science of uh, entrepreneurship. I could not agree more. I and, and I guess another valuable thing for the the health innovators listening to this, you know, listening to this podcast, and it's totally in tune with what you're saying. That is the art. And if you can nail that, I think you can be a successful entrepreneur. I think funding falls into place. I think loyal customers fall into place. I think that revenue falls into place and all of those things are, are intertwined. Yeah. I, I, I think that it's really important to pick a small niche. In another book I read, uh, this Peter Thiel book, Zero to One, really good mm -hmm. book. That's like my favorite entrepreneurship book I've read. Um, they talk about how PayPal, and he was one of the co-founders of PayPal, how they arbitrarily, they were trying to pick a niche, trying to pick a niche. They picked like a niche of a thousand potential customers. And they said, this is, this is too big. Their behaviors, their wants, their needs are, are dissimilar. You know, how can we build for all of them at once? So they kept trying to narrow it down until they decided on an extremely small segment of the population for PayPal. It was 6,000 people. Um, who were journalists that had BlackBerry phones in like 2004 or whatever it was, right? Yeah, there's only yeah. 6,000 people in all of America that have this. And <laughs> I don't even know what they needed PayPal for at the time, but it's, we, we were struggling. We were struggling. We felt like we were being torn and pulled in different directions, trying yeah. to build software and build solutions for private equity firms, large hospitals, small medical practices across oncology, dermatology. And the needs of these different practices were different. So for the first six months or three months or whatever it was after our launch, our initial users were all so different that we couldn't find a similar pattern in what they needed. Um, I think that that one picking a niche, so back to the, the most valuable yeah. insight I think I can give for healthcare innovators um, and knowing when to pivot and knowing when not to is, you know, pick a niche and have it be like 10,000 customers tops to start because you want to nail that niche and you can always change it later, but start with a group of people that you think is the best fit for what you're trying to deliver. Really understand their problem and do not deviate from that problem. Stay on course with the problem, but your approach or your solution to solve that problem is the thing that should be changing at least once a month, if not more, right? We, we basically change our approach to solving these people's problems every, every two weeks. That's we do mm -hmm. it in a sprint cycle. Every two weeks we say, Hey, what are the biggest problems these, these people are facing now? Where is Grapevine failing to, to solve their problems? Can we do more? And we draw up a whole new roadmap of what we want to build for these people. And then we, you know, me and the developers get into to actually building that. But 
staying the course on trying to deliver value to a small segment of the market is, is the most important thing. And then pivoting, pivoting, pivoting on what the solution that you imagine is. You know, I think that that might be one of the most difficult things for an entrepreneur because there's like shiny opportunity syndrome. There's all of the markets and it's hard to pick one. Um, there's definitely a systematic way of being able to assess each of those market segments or um, uh, niches that you could pursue. But I was talking to a prospect um, a couple of months ago and they were selling a, an innovation I mean, just revolutionary innovation, really, really exciting, having some success. But part of the challenge that they had was they could sell it to healthcare, um, the agricultural industry, the um, equan industry, the US, Asia, <laughs> India, and their startup. They've only been in business for a year and a half. And I was, you know, thinking to myself and saying, like you really need to pare it down. And it doesn't mean that you can't have a big vision and you can't have that impact, but it needs to be incremental over time. Um, oh. And right, it's the bowling pin strategy. It's like pick the first pin, the market that you're talking about, put Love all it. of your effort and knock that baby down. And that momentum is what's going to help you knock the other pin and knock the other pin. Otherwise, if you try to, go in multiple geographic areas or multiple verticals at the same time, you lose out on what you're experiencing, which is that word of mouth. Because if the people in agriculture are excited about it, well, they're not telling the people in the equine industry in China. Like there's, <laughs> there's no, you're not benefiting from word of mouth marketing unless you have a concentrated effort. Um, so I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I mean, I've experienced this myself um, it's just so hard. And the sooner that you can come to terms with who you're for and what you're going to offer them, um, you know, best practices say that if you're under a million dollars, you should have one market, one offer and one channel. Once you pass a million, you can look at expanding, but you want to have that kind of laser focus in the beginning. Yeah, so much. Agree. And I love the bowling pin strategy. And we've experienced it. Funny you said equine too, because we, <laughs> weirdly enough, uh, uh -huh. very, very notable like equine and like cattle feed company um, yeah. came to us pretty early on. And it was through uh, uh, actually like word of mouth. They heard about what we were doing in the healthcare space unbelievably. And they're like, we want to work with you. And saying no to them which we did they are not using grapevine we never on board oh bravo, bravo. the hardest thing ever <laughs> but yeah it's yeah. important and we focused on yeah six that we we found at some point we, we hired consultants we looked at the different market sizes the spend per medical specialty right? we're talking about a market where even in just medical supplies right for healthcare supplies yeah there's 300 billion dollars of spend a year right and there's tens of thousands, maybe even millions of, of businesses, right? So we needed to narrow that down. How do we narrow it down? Well, we bring in, you know, market researchers, we, you know, hire consultants to tell us where the market is like most ripe. And at the end of the day, I mean, yeah, the data helps and the feedback helps, but we decided to go, we scratched all the market research and data. And we went with, we've had, had three customers at that time that were very similar. They were dermatologists that had like one to five locations and they were performing plastic surgery and this and that. And there we crunched the numbers and that group of people, there were 6,000 different businesses in the United States that fit that mold of dermatology practice and dermatologists, they do spend more than for example, like a primary care, you know, a pediatric mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. a dentist. So we decided to, you know, focus on that small, that small niche. And that's when everything started clicking. And we were just listening to them and saying, not like, yeah. Can we make it a little better for you and a little better for these random other people and a little better for these random other people? But how can we make this amazing for you? And they said, yeah. we don't want to ever buy things again. And we want it to all be stocked on the shelves. And we don't want to deal with payments until 90 days after. And we want, you know, all these things. And everything fell into place at that point. And like you said, the bowling pin strategy, shortly thereafter, we've got, yeah. you know, 
other people that apparently are similar, no consultant or market research would have told us that behaviorally they had the same needs or problems. But then next thing you know, we've got massive oncology institutes with hundreds of locations across the United States hearing about us through dermatology because dermatology to Mohs surgery, skin cancer to oncology institutes, and they have a lot of the behavioral, you know, practices and issues. Um, yeah. And that's when we really started clicking, but it was probably like three to six months of feeling like we were getting torn in different directions by like Genghis Khan. And then, you know, <laughs> and then pivoting to a really hyper focus for like another three to five months. And yeah, November, December, we nailed it for dermatology. We turned off all the marketing channels, more dermatologists were signing up than we could handle. And then we started expanding into these new spaces, specifically like oncology and cardiology. Yeah, the key is the next phase of your growth is to be able to maintain that laser focus um, yeah. because it's going to get so exciting. I mean, and think about it. If you would have said yes to that equine company, I mean, it could have completely tanked your company totally. because I they could have started giving you guidance of like, yes, we want to sign this big deal with you. So, yeah, I need that cash. Let's make let, let's say yes. And then, well, we need this different. We need this different. And instead of you being able to have a solution that fits many people in one niche market, now all of a sudden you're trying to have different versions for different markets, for different needs, and you're never grow in, or scale that way. Totally. Yeah. Totally. We would have built something that was mediocre for a bunch of different, totally different yeah. people. Water and down. So it's excellent <laughs> for one group. Yeah. yeah. So um, I've heard you say, let me put my glasses on here, um, that um, the building blocks of success exist in the rubble of failure. And yeah. I love that. I don't know if you made that up. You read that I in a book. That up compilation of many books that you've read, um, wisdom from your father, who knows, but that is an incredible um, saying. And tell me more about that. I, it is crazy that you said that. I was saying that, so I was at dinner with our investors yesterday where agreements were signed and we, we were able to bring in money. And I mm. that quote came up like three or four times. And I think I made it up, you know, to the best of my ability. I take credit for it. I may have read it somewhere, but I'm pretty sure I made it up. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, I think it, it means a lot of different things. I mean, mm -hmm. it means like, don't give up, right? Like when, mm -hmm. like as humans, I, I studied biomedical engineering, which took a lot of biology courses at UPenn, um, and then computer science courses and we merged the two, but I studied a lot of bio, uh, you know, evolution and everything that is like a common trait across a species is something that we evolved to have pretty much for a reason. And maybe it's outdated. Maybe we don't need it. Maybe we have a vestigial organ, like a weird part of our pancreas or whatever hanging off or um, our appendix, but the feelings that we feel, right. The negative feelings we feel, the pain that we feel, the regret we feel, the frustration when we fail, like these are things that we've evolved to feel because they are powerful tools that we can harness and use to drive success or drive happiness or drive whatever it is that, that we're looking for. Um, when you fail, I think sometimes, and when I've failed, I've spiraled, right? I've given up. I've, you know, turned to the wrong thing. I've, you know, become a little discouraged or depressed, but that's not what we need to do. What you need to do is you need to sift through the rubble of your own failure, you know, the pain and the emotions that you're feeling, and you need to find what fragments you can use to, to, to get rid of this pain and build something that helps you never feel it again. And ultimately you'll sift through the rubble and you'll take out building blocks and you'll set course on a new path to build a new thing. And that will fall down too, right? It's a, it's a beautiful <laughs> cycle. <laughs> it's get... frustrating, but yes, it will. <laughs> it will. And then you go same process, sift through it. And it's about taking out, you know, the top 1% of, of your, I guess, or, or, you make mistakes, learn which of those things were mistakes, but in there, you'll also learn what was the right thing to do. Stay on course with those things and you'll learn more. Um, and it goes back to, you know, everything we've been talking about here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, building that muscle is incredible because honestly, I don't think that you ever get beyond it. 
Like, it's not like you ever arrive at this destination where you're like, okay, I've sorted yeah. through all the failure rubble and now we're good for the next 10 years or the next five years. It's, if, if that is the case, then you are doing nothing with your life because <laughs> anything extraordinary and powerful is going to take risk and any risk is going to have failure. So it, it, if you're ever at that point where you're not having to sort through the failure rubble, something's wrong. You need somebody to wake you up. <laughs> totally. And the, the world's changing, right? Like even something that you build that's perfect for today, it solves all of your customers' problems today. Like tomorrow it won't. Tomorrow there's a pandemic. Tomorrow an asteroid, you know, there's a million things that we need to be constantly evolving. And it, it, it goes back to that day one mentality. Even if you think you found success, I totally agree with you. You can't sit stagnant because that's how you become a, a distribution dinosaur or a dinosaur of other sorts. What you need to do is you need to look at your success and even find the failure in that and, and find yeah. the rubble, the crumbling bits and the beautiful tower you've constructed and build something new with it because nothing's ever perfect. There is no permanent success and it's always got to be about pushing things forward. Yeah, I think it just, um, as we kind of wrap up here, it makes me think of circling back to an earlier point in the conversation um, about the advantage that you have as a younger entrepreneur um, without having all the pollution, all of the bias, all of the, um, uh, you know, when I think about other clients that I've worked with that are maybe serial entrepreneurs, um, often they are wanting to make, make decisions um, or apply the same strategies that worked for them in the last go around. And it's like, well, no, this is another product. It even might be the same audience, but it's another product. Or even if it's the same audience and the same product, market conditions have changed. So you can't ever, you know, it, it, there's benefits because you learn a lot um, along the way as you build those successes and failures with these different companies, but you can't just apply the same strategies that worked last time. It's always evolving. I, I totally agree with that. And with like, like Amazon tried to roll out a huge solution in the healthcare space for medical supplies, like right after the pandemic. And it was a, it was a total bust by their standards and, and by everyone's. Yeah. And yeah. I've been to hospitals, right? The procurement departments where they have big signs, don't buy on Amazon, right? To that idea, we're, we're similar to Amazon in that we're incredibly simple to use. We create market transparency and we help you get way better yeah. prices. We're different. Right. Because the way you buy for Amazon, for your household items, you know, Christmas presents or whatever it is, is not the way that hospitals need to buy. It doesn't have the checks and balances of a financial department and accounts payable, right. and, you know, managers and, and, and different things. So the actual the user behavior. Was yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the point is, yeah, like you said, you can't just apply something that works somewhere else to something new. We tried doing that. We learned that that doesn't exactly work and we needed to custom tailor it to a small segment of the population to really make things yeah. work. Hmm. Well, Luca, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a very fantastic conversation. Um, I appreciate your anecdotes and stories and quotes. Um, is there anything else that you would want to share um, and also include your contact information in case anybody wants to follow up with you after the show? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Shoot me an email. It's Luca, L-U-K-A at go-grapevine.com. Let's go like hyphen grapevine.com. And grapevines like heard it through the grapevine, that old classic song. Yeah, um, yeah. But no, yeah, our our intentions are, are pure. We've got funding. We aren't trying to squeeze pennies out of the pockets of the people that we serve. And I consider us, a, you know, a servant to the to the people that are struggling at medical practices and to the people um, that are struggling in ordering and, and managing the financials for an independent medical practice. We recognize you guys provide a higher quality of care to patients and you do it at a more affordable price. And we want to be here to support that mission. Um, we're partners in this and we're partners in progress. So mm -hmm. that's, that's all I got today. I, Thanks, another, Dr. another quip. I love it. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for listening today. Um, for all of those that are watching and listening, if you haven't subscribed to the show, please do so. And feel free to share this with others that you think might benefit from today's conversation. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for listening. See you on the next episode of Health Innovators.